Whether you hydrate to live or live to hydrate, Liquid IV quenches your thirst faster than water alone. With three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drinks, plus eight vitamins and nutrients for everyday wellness, all in a single sugar-free stick. And listen, drinking water is great. Like I've been drinking so much water while doing the 75 hard challenge, but one stick of liquid IV in 16 ounces of water hydrates you way better than water alone. And I love it because I feel like it actually revives me. And the best part about it is that there's no artificial sweeteners and zero sugar. However you hydrate, grab your liquid IV hydration multiplier, sugar-free in bulk nationwide at Costco, or get 20% off your first order when you go to liquidiv.com and use code TK at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop better hydration today using promo code TK at liquidiv.com. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Making Moves. I'm here today with the iconic Max Siegelman. What's up? Welcome to the show. Happy to be here. I love your brand. And that's why I had to have you come on the show because I feel like you have quite the story (laughs) when it comes to being an entrepreneur. A bit, I try, Mm -hmm. yeah. You started this business of yours in 2020, tell us a little bit about the origin story. Yeah, so I started this in the summer of 2020, so midst of the pandemic, kind of by accident, I always say. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my dad is a racehorse trainer, had his own racing stable since the 80s. I uh, had nothing to do with it growing up at all, other than being um, a son of a racehorse trainer, which is like a super, I feel like rare occupation, especially like growing up right outside New York City. Everyone's parents like doctors, nurses, whatever. Um, so, yeah, I had nothing to do with it, um, but I always obviously got to go to the stable or the farm uh, or races more than most kids growing up outside the city. Um, and then I, after college, got into doing like creative marketing, social and consulting for some celebrities and athletes and musicians and was still doing that in the beginning of the pandemic, just decided to start making some hats and sweatshirts with the two existing logos that my mom happened to drop for my dad in the 80s. For On a stable. napkin, right? On a napkin. Crazy Studied story. Up. Yeah, and just started making hats and sweatshirts literally for fun, like no intention to start selling anything. Um, I started the whole thing with like three, 400 bucks. I was making three different colorway sweatshirts, three different colorway hats, mm-hmm. giving Insane. them to friends and family and just like repeated it a few times because people had so much interest in, in wanting it, not even selling it to them. Uh, and it kind of just evolved into this thing of its own. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting to me how successful this brand has become in such a short amount of time. And I feel like a lot of it, correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of attributes to you as a person kind of being a sceny guy. Like, I feel <laughs> like you, I don't know if it's by choice or just by luck or whatever the case is, but like you've always so it seems kind of been in the scene or just know what's what's going on. What's the 411? Yeah, I don't I don't know if it's necessarily like scene. I feel like I was after school, I started um, I started a company that, that no longer exists. It was like a social media aggregation app. And we had LL Cool J got involved and he was kind of my intro into like the entertainment world mm-hmm. and started to make a lot of connections in that space and then started to consult for a few other music artists and athletes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's when I started to be around those individuals. It's not like I'm a, I'm not like a huge party person, so yeah. guy like that. Um, so I think like that's kind of where it happened. And in that situation, I thought for my, my own well-being, I started just doing all these projects, literally most of the time for free for these different individuals to kind of just start creating this network for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think I definitely put a lot of uh, or give a lot of credit to my past like work and relationships on how Siegelman Stable has evolved and maybe, like you said, evolved so quickly mm-hmm. um, without spending any money. Uh, I think we've been lucky that a, a certain caliber of person has worn our stuff, uh, either when we ceded it to them or has become a customer organically. Um, and it's literally been three or a little over three years now of just a slow organic growth, but uh, what I believe in the right way and with the right customer base and audience. Mm-hmm. What do you feel like is the key to being a likable person with such high profile like celebrities around? Be normal. Like they're all normal. In what way? Being like have normal. a conversation. Don't just like totally go into like what an, I don't know what a, a PR story could pull. You know what I mean? I just feel like they're always asked those questions and just like, don't look at them as different 
type of people. Like we're mm-hmm. all just humans. Like, totally. Yeah. So I think like I've never looked at it in that sense and I've never looked at them in like a different way. Um, but again, like I said, like I was thrown into that world in more of a, a working sense uh, and just started to gain trust and respect and kind of start those relationships and network. Mm-hmm. Do you have any rules you kind of live by when it comes to networking? I mean, I think it's literally what I I think you just live by in general is just like show respect to someone who is in any different position or any position at all Um, because you never know where they're going to end up. You never know where you're going to end up. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think relationships in my line of work until Siegelman Stable and even till now and through Siegelman Stable is the most valuable thing you can have. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not like you're, those relationships mean like you're asking for favors and you're asking for this and that. It's more so just having it and being able to network and talk to people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say it all the time is like try and talk to over 100 people a day. That's awesome. Yeah. In what way do you talk to 150 Text, people Text, email, phone calls, DMs. Uh, I still run Siegelman Stable social media. Like I'll respond to everything and anything pretty much. Um, same thing on my own. I'll go into requests or like, I don't know what the other tab is. Yeah. It's like requests that didn't make it through the first request. Uh, and honestly, if I didn't go through that, I wouldn't be having a conversation about a potential partnership that we're in the middle of talking to now. So it's like you don't know what's in there. You don't know who who's doing what, who's working on what. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's just so many opportunities that can be lost by not just talking to people. Mm-hmm. Totally. I think it's so important what you said is you never know where someone's going to end up. Do you have any crazy stories or like personally that, you know, you've worked with someone when you were interns and now they're this person that you can share? That's a good question. Um, I don't know if I have one on the top of my mind, but I, I think like when I was consulting for uh, music artist X, there was also someone probably my age or maybe a little bit younger that was just like a coffee runner. Mm-hmm. And now that person is literally heading up their creative strategy and album release concepts and song release concepts so it's like you literally never know where people are going to end up Mm -hmm. and even it's not even entertainment or in fashion or or whatever it's like my brother has worked at the same bank for 18 years and he's had bosses leave and come back and he's now the boss of them so like imagine if you were his boss 18 years ago and you treated him like shit. And you were a dick. Yeah, yeah. right? You treated him like an intern because it was his first He's or like, second my year. my turn to treat you yeah, like so a it's dick. Like, yeah. you literally, in any field, in any professional place, it's just like, just act with respect. If you don't get along with someone, it's just like, just they're still human. Mm-hmm. You don't mm-hmm. know what people are going through. I think that's something that I've like tried to live by even more so in the last two years is like, you don't know the shit people go through in whatever else they're doing outside of the few minutes you're in front of them. Um like life's not easy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> not to go on a tangent, but like, <laughs> no. that, like, but like literally it's, it's, I feel like it fits in that. It's just like, it just treat everyone the same. Mm-hmm. I also think people remember the little things more than you'd think. Like the little in- interactions, yeah. the little reaching out, the little messages, which I think is yeah. so cool that you do that on a daily basis. I got the most random text. I'll go on a tangent now. Uh, like a small story. Uh, I love it. from someone who's not involved with Siegel and Stable, but I know him pretty well. And he was texting me the other day. He's like, yeah, you're walking through Westchester, like just north of Manhattan in New York. Um, and he's like, someone was wearing a Siegel and Stable hat. And I was like, hey, do you know Max? And like, you, I get that a lot. It's like, oh, I saw someone wearing this. And like more so now it's like, they don't know, which is, sounds much better for me. Um, <laughs> but she's like, I happen to know. She's like, I sat next to him on a plane and he helped me with my baby. And she sent a picture of the woman. And I like, remember we were like, I was flying back from a work trip to New York. Uh-huh. And she had, like, this literally infant baby. It must have been a few months old, like, sitting in the middle seat. Oh, my God. And then she was in the window and I was in the aisle. And she was going to the bathroom. And she was like, can you hold my baby? <gasps> Shut and I was like, I swear. <laughs> and it was literally that woman. And I, like, remember that. Um, so it's like. POV, you on a plane holding a random person's baby? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a very cute baby. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, again, like, you never know where these people will end up, what stories people will tell. You never know where you'll end up. And you don't want stories ever to come back to you, right? Like, oh, you're such a dick. You didn't hold yeah. my baby. But, like, I don't think anyone would be like, I'm not going to hold so your baby. Wait, so was she wearing your hat? Yeah, she was wearing my hat. And he went up to her. And I had no idea. Did she think, know, like, oh, you you were the founder? I think she, she we followed each other on Instagram at that moment That's or something so like that. Sweet. Yeah. So uh, So, yeah, it's like you never know. Even just that interaction. Like, yeah. what if she had a negative experience totally. and then she went, yeah, so it's like. She makes a TikTok canceling you these days. <laughs> That's how it works, unfortunately. It works. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully uh, that doesn't happen. I, I don't think it will, <laughs> based on um, how you live your life. Okay, I want to talk a little bit more about the brand getting started, because I think yeah. the fact that it's ultimately like this family business, mm-hmm. 
and has so much family history is so cool. And I think that's what really speaks to people is they're like, oh my gosh, this like yeah. feels so small even though it's so big. I think it's a, I think it's what helped us break through, like you said, like so fast or just like there's a lot of clutter just in fashion, like whether it's fast fashion or a brand that's trying to build like we are. Um, it's People say it's like the hardest time to start a brand, but I actually always say now it's like it's the easiest time to start a brand, but it's the hardest time to break through and continue on and not be shut down in a year. Mm-hmm. And I think because there's a real story, there's a heritage story to it, my dad's story, the additional layer of equine therapy and opening it up to different programs for veterans or inner city youth kids, kids with special needs, it speaks to a wider audience and for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the way that we've tried to cultivate his story into the brand and create content around it with every campaign or release or collaboration we do is a big piece of why uh, that I think it's helped break through a lot of that noise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of explain to me what (sighs) being a racehorse trainer looks like? Like the day to day. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. So I grew up just outside New York City on Long Island. Siegelman Stable and its prime was at the Meadowlands in New Jersey during the race season. And your father owns yes. this stable. Yeah. Okay. And trained racehorses for multiple different people or groups of people who owned racehorses. How the hell do you train a racehorse? Uh, you should interview him. Uh, <laughs> you want me to call him? Yes. Uh, he, uh, so I'll go, I guess I'll go back to how he started too after. So he had his racing stable during in-season of racing at uh, the Meadowlands, which is next to Giant Stadium. Uh, and then in the off-season was in South Jersey and Freehold. So okay. he would wake up at 4 a.m., literally at 4 a.m., drive an hour, an hour and a half to the stable, start training the horses around like 5.30, even maybe even earlier wow. in the morning. And that's when they trained. And then sometimes he would stay there and then race at night or he would drive home and then go back and race at a different track mm-hmm. uh, and would travel Pennsylvania, Ohio, like wherever races were. Is the Derby like the ultimate? No. So the Kentucky Derby and what the logo of Siegelman Stable with the cart behind it uh-huh. is different. So harness racing is which what my dad did is with Got the cart it. behind it. Okay. Yeah. So the Kentucky Derby is when like the jockey sits the on jockey. top of the horse. Okay. Yeah. So are they um, still called a jockey if they're in they're the They're actually cart? called a driver. Oh, when a driver. I talk to people who have no clue, I, I sometimes say jockey because then they get it Just in their head. Like, it's like, like saying yeah, I'm from it. Chicago. I'm really from the suburb. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, <laughs> so they're called a driver. Um, but yeah, I mean, he got into it when he also grew up on Long Island, a town over from where he raised me and my mom raised me. Um, and there used to be a famous racetrack called Roosevelt Raceway that by the time I was born, it was knocked down and it was a Roosevelt Mall. Uh, but that was like crazy, like in the 80s and in the early 90s, like they would get 30,000 people to show up for races on a fucking Wednesday night. Wow. Yeah. Like I look back at some of the pictures and it's like unbelievable. Um, and anytime that we're creating like pieces or capsules, like we always look back to those pictures. And that's kind of like where we get the majority of our inspiration mm-hmm. for um, a lot of the stuff that we're doing, which we can talk about mm-hmm. in a minute. But um, I think like that's kind of where he got his start. And he started working at like an auto body shop and like they messed around with horses either on the gambling side or on the training side. And it's kind of just how he got into it. Mm-hmm. Went to college, met my mom, somehow played with horses while playing soccer in college and then came back and decided to give it a go. Wow. Yeah. You grew up not really around the horses though. No, I mean, I grew up like I would go to work with him and like go to the barn or go to the stable mm-hmm. and go to races more than your average whatever year old. Yeah, um, more than me. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but it's not like I grew up and I like, woke up in the morning, ate breakfast, went out back and like started mm-hmm. cleaning up the horses. Like I didn't grow up on a farm. I grew up in a suburb of New York City. <laughs> so when, <laughs> So when you... We're in the midst of COVID mm. and you decided to throw this on a hat, like yeah. the your mom's logo, which, mm. by the way, is this the actual logo that's Siegelman stable, yeah. like the actual stable? This does it still it. exist, the stable? The stable does not really exist anymore because he, which I think benefits because if you start losing races, kind of not cool. But uh, he- You're like, that's bad for my brand. <laughs> yeah, he, he actually retired like right before the pandemic started. Mm-hmm. Um, he still manages some racehorses, but he, majority of his time is all given to equine therapy and- um, doing equine therapy with veterans and kids with special needs and stuff. Which is essentially horse therapy, yes. correct? Uh, or can so you explain e- what it is? So equine therapy is not, it's not therapy for the horses. It's, it's therapeutic for humans. Yeah. So 
either for special needs kids, whether they're autistic um, or uh, veterans who suffer from PTSD, um, or how he started it was bringing inner city youth programs from Newark, New Jersey, uh, and these kids for after school programs uh, who probably never even imagined they'd see a horse in person. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, the true definition of equine therapy, you'd have to Google it, but mine is like literally I did. Like when, <laughs> when you're in, in front of these animals that are like so majestic, you just kind of forget about everything that's going mm-hmm. on around you and you just pay full attention to them, mm-hmm. where it's like you kind of lose thought about everything else happening. And it relaxes you. Exactly, Mm -hmm. yeah. And the horses react to how you react to a horse. Mm -hmm. And one of the animals that reacts like more to what their human in front of them is doing Mm -hmm. versus any other animal. So if you're all uptight and crazy, Mm -hmm. they're most likely going to be all uptight and crazy. But these equine therapy um, horses are like super tame, relaxed. Uh, So yeah, I mean, I've heard some like pretty crazy stories. I even think Kendall Jenner has like spoken about it on Jay Shetty's podcast. Mm-hmm. So obviously she rides horses and she's had horses her whole life. And wears your brand. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> has worn our brand. Um, but how that is literally equine therapy um, for her. The one thing that has kept me sane throughout the 75 hard challenge and more importantly has kept me hydrated the most is liquid IV. Y'all, when I tell you, I literally crave liquid IV. Like the lemon lime flavor lives rent free in my head. First of all, it just always quenches my thirst, but it is perfectly sour and has that tangy taste to it. And it's just so good. Like a nice cold, crisp glass of liquid IV. Oh my gosh, sounds so good. Whether you hydrate to live or live to hydrate, Liquid IV quenches your thirst faster than water alone with three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drinks plus eight vitamins and nutrients for everyday wellness, all in a single sugar-free stick. So I actually just taste tested all of the flavors for you guys, the pear, the white peach, the green grape, and the lemon lime. And I have to tell you, I still think lemon lime is my favorite. (laughs) But my second favorite is green grape. And then my third favorite, believe it or not, is pear. I'm actually shocked by how much I like pear. And then in fourth place for me was the white peach. My favorite thing about liquid IV is how convenient it is, especially because I am always on the go. I am booked and busy, and I'm sure you guys are too. So being able to pack it so easily in a purse or a carry-on or whatever the case is, like my work bag, I always have a liquid IV in there because throughout my day, I get so thirsty and nothing truly satisfies my thirst craving other than a liquid IV. Like it is so good. I literally want to make one right now. And listen, drinking water is great. Like I've been drinking so much water while doing the 75 hard challenge, but one stick of liquid IV in 16 ounces of water hydrates you way better than water alone. And I love it because I feel like it actually revives me. And the best part about it is that there's no artificial sweeteners and zero sugar. However you hydrate, grab your Liquid IV hydration multiplier, sugar-free in bulk nationwide at Costco, or get 20% off your first order when you go to liquidiv.com and use code TK at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop better hydration today using promo code TK at liquidiv.com. I love how important it is to you and your brand when it comes to giving back like you donate proceeds to equine mm-hmm. therapy yeah we correct? donate a portion of all proceeds to different equine mm-hmm. therapy programs. why is why is that so important to you so when i started doing this and and started selling it to make a profit off of it and make it a business i always said that they would just stick this stick to the story of my dad for good if mm-hmm. we're going to do it and a big piece of his story was this equine therapy or is this equine therapy piece so he had his racehorse stable, which if you had a, a your own stable and were training racehorses, like that was it. That was your bread and butter. That was your job. And he added that additional layer of it, of having different programs come in and use the horse, the racehorses in a different way. Um, and typically you won't see equine therapy programs in a racing stable. Racehorses are typically a little bit more uptight and high strung. Yeah. Um, but uh, he opened it up and wanted to utilize what he had um, for another cause for additional good. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's important to give back? I think it's important to give back for everyone. I I think if you're in a position to give back, you should try and do it in different ways. And it doesn't always have to be money. It could be Mm -hmm. time. It can be whatever it is. It could be writing a quote to put in something. Like it could be anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I myself like take a lot for granted. Uh, And I think you need to remind yourself and giving back, I think is the one second of thinking about it. You can just 
give back and find some gratitude for whatever you're doing in life because it's probably a lot better than the majority of other people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are ways in your life currently that you try to practice gratitude? Uh, I probably don't do it well enough. My fiance does a really good job of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's just like being thankful for the small things that happen on a daily basis. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm thankful that Siegel and Stable has gotten to this point, but I'm thankful for outside of work stuff, a lot of things, for having a family, for having friends, mm -hmm. just small things in life that I think a lot of people take for granted that a lot of people don't have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So when you were coming up with this whole brand, mm -hmm. And having this branding of your father's Siegelman stable, did you have any idea like how big this would be slash did you want it to even be this big at that point when you started to put it on like one hat? No. I mean, I started by accident. I always yeah. say that. Like I literally never started it to intend to like try and sell stuff. Um, I started it just so like me and my brother and family and friends could have a piece because they wanted it. And I had a hat that my dad had made in like the 80s uh, and a jacket that my dad had made. It had like my grandpa's name on it. It was mm -hmm. only two pieces I had and they're like super old and vintage. And I honestly, I never wore them. Um, but the one time I started wearing the jacket, people always had comments about it. When I wore the hat, people had comments about it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, hmm, like there's something here. And like, I think one of the things I was wearing the jacket and some guy came up to me on the street and was like, started telling me just a random horse story. And then it happened again and again, like three times almost, like different people. Because they would see your hat they or would your see jacket? They the hat or the jacket and the logo. And yeah. like, I was like, it feels like everyone has a horse story. <laughs> mm -hmm. And like the more people you talk to, like they have a horse story, whether it's just as simple as like, oh, my grandparents used to go to the track or my dad used to take me to this or whatever. So I feel like there's everyone – not everyone, but a lot of people to some extent have like a horse story. Yeah. Um, and I also think it's like a horse is just like if you look at a lot of high end fashion brands like Polo or high end like Hermes or mm -hmm. Gucci that uses horse. They're all uh, affiliated like with a horse. Like they're very high end. Yeah. And they're all affiliated with it. And like you look back in history, it's like horses are affiliated with like royalty. So like there's always been. In my mind, there's an aspirational piece and there's a relatable piece to mm -hmm. horses. And even when we started, when I was like, okay, I'm going to make this a business. I'm going to launch a website. I'm going to donate proceeds to equine therapy. I'm going to start um, seeding it out to some people I have relationships with. When I started doing seeding, I was like, I have an aspirational list and I have a relatable list. Mm -hmm. And I think the relatable list is where you see Kendall Jenner and the Hadid sisters and people you see publicly who have horses, ride horses, whatever it is. And then I had an aspirational list where it was like m maybe more geared towards – um, like inner city or city and urban uh, where it was like future and some hip hop artists that I might have had relationships with because their audience is maybe lives more in a city and uh, has never seen a horse, rode a horse, mm -hmm. been, to, been to a track, whatever it is. And I think both they have a middle ground that they have the relatability of either knowing, being aware of, wearing it, whether it's polo or Hermes yeah. or whatever it is. Um, so that's kind of just how it started to like just thoughts around the creativity piece of it or the strategy behind it started. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of relatability to people in different walks of life to horses. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your demographic? Yeah, it's a good question. And they, I, we get asked a lot. I think it's a I think we're kind of across the board um, and you see it fluctuate depending on like products you put out between male and female. Um, but like the first two celebrity sightings was like Gunna and Future, who are two hip hop artists from Atlanta and their That's audience. That's crazy. Yeah. Were you not like, what the hell? Yeah, I mean, Gunna wearing this sweatshirt, and I always say the story, it's like, it was probably like one Did of Did you the... send it to him? Yeah, so I, I sent it to him and I sent it to Future, but like they get sent a ton of stuff. Like mm -hmm. you never know if they're gonna actually wear it. So Gunna was wearing it, the sweatshirt in a music studio with like, look like leather pants that I'm sure he bought for tons of money. And he's wearing like literally a $9 sweatshirt that I like <laughs> printed. Because uh, it was like the first run. It was when like I, what, one of one? Like This is like one of 10 maybe? Yeah. yeah. Like when I first started, we were literally obviously using blanks, which is a lot of how brands start mm -hmm. uh, and just like printing on it. And then same with the hats. Like we were buying blanks and we were embroidering on it. Um, and then two weeks after Gunna wore the sweatshirt, Future was wearing the hat in a music video. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that for us obviously started to create this community around Siegelman Stable that defined was defined a bit about around their audiences. So mm -hmm. very um, city, urban, 
uh, hip hop artist type of demographic. Mm -hmm. And then later on, Kendall Jenner wore it. Obviously, that hits a completely different demographic, some crossover. Which was insane. Yeah. When she wasn't it when she had her red hair. She yeah. like debuted her red hair. Yeah, she was going from. And she was wearing your hat. Yeah, so the That's press crazy. was all over it because they were trying to get pictures of her with her red hair. Um, I think she was going to the off-white show in Paris. Insane. Yeah, so it was during Fashion Week. It's like still, that image is still used in like Vogue as like inspo fall girl pick. Like it's, it's pretty <laughs> wild. Yeah. <laughs> that is crazy. I mean, what was the feeling like when you saw that? Yeah, uh, it was it was wild. Uh, we were actually we as my fiance and I were in Miami in a coffee shop at like 8 a.m. Uh, I had no intention to sell that colorway hat at that moment. What was the colorway? It was a black brim, black embroidery and like a khaki um, base. OK. Um, like I didn't have any mate. I literally made a dozen, I think. And we seeded it to her three days before she wore it. I sent it to L.A. And somehow it ended up in Paris on her head three days later. Um, luck. Like a, a lot of, I think a lot of what happened to start with Siegelman Stable is networking and relationships, uh, positioning, storytelling, and luck. Uh, and I think with any anything that moves quicker than the average, I think a lot of luck is involved with it. And I think we've been lucky and fortunate and blessed to have a lot of opportunities and be on the right people in front of the right people. Do you believe that you kind of need to be at the right place or on the right track in order for luck to happen? Yes, I think you do. And did you feel like you were on that track? I think I think we set ourselves up in different places to be able to benefit from an opportunity happening. How did you do that? How did you set yourself up for uh, luck to happen? I think it's treating everyone the same. Mm -hmm literally doing work for free not that you would need to do that but it helps doing stuff for free for people that can always come back to you for something building that trust building that respect building a big network mm -hmm. and i think all of those different pillars were super important to get us to the place we're at mm -hmm. what celebrity or influencer has worn siegelman stable that you immediately saw like an influx of orders from yeah i mean kendall is probably one of the biggest right I think um, it I think people think because celebrity X or athlete Y wear something all of a sudden it's like go mm -hmm. and the model that we have the like business model that we have isn't necessarily like when Kendall wore it it got picked up in press it got picked up in social like our website was fucking locked like that was our <laughs> business model our business model and to an extent still is like is a drop model it's limited we drive secondary market. We want to build hype and we want to make people run to us when we do a release. Mm -hmm. um, and that strategy has worked for now. And I think as you continue to build a business and figure out where you are and what your audience is and mm -hmm. how they respond, you make some turns and adjustments um, or additions and kind of also keep that. But I think that um, we... We, we, were, we weren't set up necessarily to take full advantage of that moment, but when it happened, we were flexible enough to move to be able to figure out how to sell that hat in that moment to the people that wanted it, build up the hype around it maybe for the next few weeks too, and then do another drop. Mm -hmm. but so you're like, I need this colorway actually. Yeah, I like, <laughs> uh, yeah yes. Um, like I don't want to oversaturate. Uh -huh. Like I think it takes away from brand equity and I think it like as a – as a brand that's been built off of organic slow growth and spending zero dollars on marketing still to this day. That is insane. Yeah, you have to be super strategic about how you do releases, how you do the build up for releases and who you align with. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, there's the, the extra layer of the brand is my name. So I am super careful of how we do stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't take that for granted. And there's things that come our way that, as a 16 year old Max, I'd be like, we have to do it. And I sit there for 30 seconds. I'm like, fuck, we can't do it. And it's because you just have to be so careful of how you're trying to grow. If I wanted us to be an overnight success and sell as many hats as possible, I made that decision 16 months ago that I didn't want that. I didn't Why? want- Why? 
I, I mean, I remember the moment like clear in my mind. It was like January. I'm still working my corporate job, which I was still working until October 2023, by the way. So, like, oh, my God. Yeah. I've only been doing this now four months full time. What was your corporate job? Um, I was the head of cultural relevance for Outfront Media, which is the largest uh, out of home media agency in North America. Good for you. Something like that. <laughs> and wait, why? So why did you stay at your corporate job for that long? I was in a position, I think, that most people don't get where I reported directly to the CMO my whole seven and a half years there. I started as a 24-year-old starting their social media department for a $2 billion public company. And so you really knew the ins and outs of social media? Sure. But like, does anyone? <laughs> no, literally. So true. Um, so true. Yeah, it like, changes every day. Like I was like 24 and I was like, yeah, I can do this. Like, I know how to post on Instagram and Snapchat. Let's do it. <laughs> Um, and I like, st and I had a really good relationship with, uh, my boss and I still talk to her and she's been the CMO there for a, a super long time, even before I started there. And I had my consulting company and I got to keep that when I started there one rare already. Mm -hmm. And then when I started doing this in the pandemic, I was like, Hey, I'm helping out a family business. Like I'm going to launch this, like just giving you a heads up, like whatever. And I was super supported by them and everything that I was doing. Which is with amazing, it. and rare. Yeah, which is yeah. rare. So I think the short answer is why was I still there? It was like I was in a I was in a very fortunate position, working for the right person, working for the right company, and got to delegate my time accordingly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessarily the case for entrepreneurs that that's a thing. Um, I think it's more of a rarity. So I don't take that for granted. Yeah, the the situation you were in was definitely rare, but it's so not rare for an entrepreneur to have a full-time thing, like for a, for a long time before they go yeah. full-time entrepreneur. Yeah. And my question for you is, how do you know when it's time to pivot and you yeah. know full, go full-time entrepreneur yeah. and really pursue this? Because it's scary. Yeah, I mean, I think I knew the brand was at an inflection point of like, okay, you can keep doing this, but how big can you grow it if you're only giving it X amount of time? Mm -hmm. um, and I think to go back to where this conversation started, it was like, in January of 2023, I was at a work trip somewhere in Florida and I called a friend of mine uh, and I was like, yeah, I need five seconds of your time. And he, we've been friends for like 15 years. We run marathons together. He like talked me into my first marathon, but he's been in like the entertainment relationship world for a long time. And I was like, he's like, you got two options. He like laid it out. He's like, you got two options. He's like, you want to sell $5 million worth of hats in the next 18 months? Or you want to build the, this thing up and see where it can go? Um, and obviously, I think one is a lot easier. I think they're both very difficult, by the way. I think one's a lot easier and one's a lot more difficult. And I decided to take the more difficult route, um, partially, again, because I think the family name, you to me, like you want to pay as much respect to like your family name and like the brand name yourself and mm -hmm. obviously my dad's story. And like I wouldn't want to just kind of like diminish it by just trying to sell as many hats as possible and move on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at that time also you saw a lot of brands start to kind of just launch like the kind of content creator space or like the content creator e-com space, mm -hmm. I'll call it. Um, like launch and, and I didn't have that platform or audience before. And it was like a little bit of an extra additional like motivational layer for me to kind of want to just grow this from nothing. Um, so yeah, I decided that that was kind of the right time to, to do it. Uh, I went full time. My fiance went full time. Um, Cause did she have a, fu a full time job as she well? She was a, a full time stylist. She still styles one or two people. Which is um, like s your guys' backgrounds are so convenient for yeah, the position I mean, you're in now. Yeah, I mean she's creative director of Siegelman Stable for yeah. a reason, and I'm like a talking head and do our collaborations and mm -hmm. partnerships and all that stuff. But like we're a two or a three person team now. We just hired someone else in January full time. Amazing. Um, Congrats. Yeah, um, she's the best. Also, so. Um, yeah, I mean, we're a small team. We all work on everything, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, that was kind of the moment where I felt like it had to, it had to happen to really make a run at it. Mm -hmm. Now that you have your first full-time employee, yeah. what would you say has been the best investment you have made as a founder? Mm -hmm in your business is it an employee is it time spent here is it yeah. an office space like what do you feel like has been the best investment you've made thus far yeah i mean I, it's hard to pinpoint one i think like as you go through different phases of building the business like yes we finally moved into a legit office in the garment district in new york city 
that looks straight at the the Empire State Building and has light and like a huge upgrade from what we had before, which was literally just like a dark closet and we were doing fulfillment and everything out of there. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, that's helped. Um, I think obviously bringing on another full-time employee um, who is just super hardworking and will just do anything and like just take the effort to go and do stuff before you even say that you need it done um, is huge. Um, And I think just surrounding yourself with the right people is definitely important. And I don't necessarily know that that's a financial investment. I think it's just a relationship investment, a time investment. Yeah, I think it's a culmination of a lot of different things that you you try and balance your time because it's just so limited Mm -hmm. uh, to try and figure out what's the best for the business. And then obviously, personally, too, you need to be able to breathe, which sometimes you don't get to. Yeah. (laughs) Speaking of time, how the hell do you manage your schedule? Uh, Sometimes well, sometimes not. I definitely have to start every morning like working out. Uh, You're a big runner. I'm a big runner. Uh, How'd you get into running? I was talked into my first marathon by my friend who I was just talking about. So I ran the New York City Marathon the last four or five years, and I said that I'll run it forever. It's my favorite day on TikTok. I, mean, it's, <laughs> I love it's, the video. It's nuts. It's honestly one of the best days in, in New York City. Uh, no other day in New York City do all New Yorkers pretty much get along, and the city shuts down for one thing and one thing only. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's special. It's super special. So, yeah, I mean, I played soccer my entire life. I played through college, and then I always have kind of stuck on that kind of regiment where it's like you wake up, you work out. You start working and it's kind of like definitely a very regimented person. What time do you go to bed? Somewhere between 10 and 11. And then what time uh, do you wake up? not that bad. I wake up a few times a week at 4 a.m. That is crazy. Uh, So anywhere between 4 and 6. And is it hard to wake up for you at 4 a.m.? No, because it's like you're on a mission. It's like, all right, I got to get up and I got to go. Um, so anytime between 4 and 6, it's I usually get up at 4 twice a week and then every other day at 6 on the weekends I sleep in a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, what's sleeping in to what anywhere between 7 30 and 8 30 oh yeah it depends i mean okay. if you're out a little the night before you're not getting up that early mm-hmm. but so yeah i think like I, that definitely for me is how i need to like start my day to feel like okay we're getting going um we've been coming to la so much now that we have a factory out here as well making stuff where it's like this i'm now currently in la obviously like my fifth or sixth trip of the year and we're just in the beginning of march so mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no day is the same, really. One day we'll have to do like making moves on the road and go look at your factory or something. Come on in. That would be fun. Yeah. One thing I struggle with, with being a content creator, like running my own business is managing my time in the sense where it's like, oh, when do I go out to this event and network? Or when do I go to this dinner and network where I'm technically not making money, but it's, (laughs) it's really good in the long run versus Mm -hmm. like staying at home and essentially doing the work. Yeah. Do you ever struggle with this and how do you know which to choose when you're in a pickle like that? Definitely struggle with that. So I think, I think one living in New York city, I think it's a lot easier to say yes. It's a lot easier to bail and it's also a lot easier to get to a lot of stuff. So like (laughs) LA to me is so crazy. Like, (laughs) Like I came from downtown LA in the factory to here and it could be like 40 minutes or it could be like 20 minutes, but Mm -hmm. like you're still in LA. So like LA is not a city. LA is like a country. It's like a state. It's like absurd. (laughs) It's state. So like, I think like the benefit of living in New York is like you can get around fast. Mm -hmm. I drive everywhere like a lunatic. Most people in New York don't. That's crazy. Yeah. It's a little stupid. My car got towed today. Actually, I like looked at it. I'm like, hmm, that's not where I parked it. So I guess I parked it illegally, but I think I say yes to a lot. And I think because I know where we're at as a business, I think networking is still so important. Uh-huh. Just have those like fluid, organic conversations. Like you never know who you're going to sit next mm-hmm. to. So I know like some kid who hosts this dinner once a month and brings people in on different topics and he'll invite me every now and then. I was like, fuck, I really got to go. I bailed on one. I went to the next one. And I'm like sitting across the table from someone who held, holds a really good job at a video game company and like we're talking and 30 seconds later he's like all right i'm going to text this team in my company and if half of them know what siegelman stable is i'm going to make sure that your brand's in the game next year whoa yeah it's like the most random shit so like things just happen where like you have to take that even if it's just showing up for 10 minutes so true you know and it's like that's harder i think in la 
It is where harder. it's like in New York, you're like, all right, I can in and out an Irish exit. Yeah. Uh, That's how I feel when I go on a date. I'm like, I just wasted like three hours going on a shitty date. Yeah, it's tough. It's yeah. tough. I mean, I'm a good Irish exiter. Maybe not from a date. That's tough. <laughs> yeah. from an, I'm like, yeah. I got to go to the bathroom. Yeah. yeah. It's very easy to say no. I've definitely made an effort over the last two years to say yes to a lot more. Mm -hmm. And I try to follow through to at least 50% of it. That's good. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's. It's hard sometimes because there are moments where you do go and you're like, ah, that wasn't worth my time. Yeah. Like, that's just inevitable. It's definitely going to happen. It's yeah. definitely going to happen. Uh, but the one time it doesn't and it feels good mm -hmm. and you make a good connection or you can make something happen, then you're like, yeah, but, like, what if I didn't go to that? Mm -hmm. Do you have any go-to questions when you're in a room with important people? I'm the worst at this. Really? I'm the worst. Like, do you have any go-tos where you're like, oh, I don't know what to ask next. I guess I'll ask this. No, I should. <laughs> I'm like the worst. Like I can small talk, but like that's that's a good question. What is my go-to? Fuck, I don't know. My go-to is: Do you have any trips coming up? Yeah, that's because everyone always has a trip coming that's up, even if it's in like a year. Yeah, they normally do. But that is a good I feel one. like it's always like good to have before, three in the in the bank. Yeah, because like, so what's your three? Any um, trips coming up? Do you have any trips coming up? Do you have any siblings? Okay. Because people love to, t I feel like, talk about their family yeah. or like it gets, or that where are you quick. from? That's like, no. Yeah. Or I'll be like, um, where are you from? And then normally I try and make a connection. Like if they're from, you know, Birmingham, I'm like, oh my God, I just went on this blah, blah, yeah, blah. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, do you have siblings or get them to talk about their family? Yeah. But I always try and get them chatting about a subject we can expand on, if yeah. that makes sense. Or I'll ask like, what do you do when you're not working? Yeah. That's, a good that's one like too. a good one. What do you do when you're not working? I'm pretty low key. Work out, hang with family, hang with friends. Yeah. I like pretty not that exciting. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, I'm like chill. I feel like we like so Caroline, not my fiance mm -hmm. and I like obviously we work together. We live together. What's so, that like, like? It's a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, like there's days where you go home and you're like eating dinner at, like 830 or nine after a long day. And like you don't want to talk about work. And then you're just like, fuck, we're talking about work. And it's hard. Uh, it's like, how do you not, though? It is because like and I, I think I deal with it a little bit better than her. And she'll stab have a stab at me for la saying that. But like, I think I <laughs> sorry, Caroline, I think. No, I think I do. And it, and it, by the way, it's like she's probably better off because like I'm like, OK, because like I maybe understand or I realize, at least in my head, it's like a person's job really molds kind of like who they are, even if you work like a corporate job or you're an entrepreneur or you're an athlete. Like whatever it is, it kind of like molds who you are of and like course. you have that, like that's your thing. And like we are in a fun, amazing, lucky position where we have this thing that we're building together. And I think like I'm good with that. And like I can talk about that and we can like – but there's definitely times where I'm like, fuck, we like really need to talk about something else. But it's hard because you're in the midst of building, planning like nonstop. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it's hard. It is. Like, sometimes Absolutely. we're in bed at 1130 at night and like she's on her laptop and I'm like, I'm trying to like walk through an idea and she's a lot better at articulating it from a design perspective. 30 seconds later, I'll be passed out on her and she's still going at it for another hour <laughs> and a half. So, so kudos to her. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 hard. And I think we try and just balance it mm -hmm. to an extent. That mm -hmm. all said, it's like we're also lucky that we're in this position because I've now been to L.A. six times this year or five times this year. And so is she. So it's like we get to travel together. We get to do this stuff together. So I think like we try and look at it in the other way around. We're like we're lucky that we get to do this together. Mm -hmm. So even if there is an obnoxious amount of overlap, like at least we're obnoxiously overlapping in all of it together. Um, so I think that's a positive to it. Absolutely. I think it's also cool that you guys, like you said, can relate on the life. Like you guys can confide in each other when you're – dealing with something that's going wrong because like you out of all people understand yeah it would be what a lot she's harder if i was only doing it or she Absolutely. was only doing it yeah probably a lot harder if i was the only one doing it because i don't deal with things as well as she does maybe sometimes. <laughs> so like if i went home and i'm like not in the best of mood from something that happened and she's or like i don't get it wrong, yeah right and like that's not great mm -hmm. but at least like she gets it and she exactly. can like know how to deal with it versus not that situation mm -hmm. so how did you guys meet mutual friends old school yeah. And how long ago was this? Three and a half years ago. Wow. And yeah. you. We, so we met six or six or so months after I started Siegelman Stable. And I said, please don't get involved. And three weeks later, she was running the shit. No way. I swear. 
<laughs> was that yeah. kind of attractive to you? That's a good question. I guess maybe in a way, yeah. But like, so her like fashion sense, she's from Norway. So their wow. fashion sense is like simplicity and like silent luxury. Is that uh-huh. what everyone says these days? Yeah. Like that's the epitome of like Scandinavian fashion. Mm-hmm. Um, so like her aesthetic, her vibe, her design, all of those things is like all things that you see in Siegelman Stable and I think we'll start to see more of as we get into our higher end pieces and our ready to wear and all that stuff. Um, so she's like she's definitely like put her creative direction on it and has made it what it is. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. What do you think makes you and Caroline a good match? Uh, good question. I think a lot. I mean, I think, I think our personalities blend well together. Um, in what way? This is not a bad thing. She definitely has a lot more energy towards opinions than I do in a positive way. Towards others' opinions or giving her opinions? giving her opinion. Okay. Um, and ideas and is outspoken about it. Whereas like I'm less about that. Mm -hmm. And I think that we find a middle ground that works really well. Um, I just think the way that we work is just works. Uh, and like, she's very good at what she's good at and I'm good at what I'm good at and Mm -hmm. what I'm good at, she's not. And what she's good at, I'm not. And it's just like, we happen to work together and be together and it's just worked. Do you think being opposites is key to a good relationship? Uh, I think being opposites on certain things is definitely key to a relationship. Mm -hmm. I think being the same on certain things is as well. Uh, like I can go out, I can go to four networking things a week. And she would never want to do that. Like she'd really? rather be home on a laptop doing work, uh-huh. but she can do it. So I think like if we were both that, like we wouldn't be doing the networking piece. So I think that that's where we find that balance. And mm-hmm. um, I think that's what makes it work. And it's special. Yeah. What are you similar in? I mean, I'm similar where like I can also be an introvert and be home at 830 mm-hmm. on a Friday night and watch a movie and have dinner and go to bed. Uh, I think like we have similar interests and in, and. In, personality traits like we both want to travel a ton we both want to uh build this from the ground we both want to work together we both want to um work for ourselves Mm -hmm. um so yeah okay last question about caroline that i wanted to ask is what has caroline brought to the table in regards to your brand that has opened up a fresh perspective or opened up your eyes to something that you like wouldn't otherwise seen on your own Everything. Uh, Honestly, everything, though. Like, I have no fashion background. Uh, I've consulted with, like, a few creative directors of fashion brands before on projects and stuff. But, like, I have no fashion background. Like, she studied fashion. She was a stylist. Like, she has the eye for it and the uh, idea of the aesthetic for it. And so I think everything she's brought from what our photo shoots look like to what our website looks like, like, she should have all the credit. She mm-hmm. should be sitting here doing it. <laughs> I know. We wish Caroline was yeah, here. She won't do this, though. She won't? No. Oh, okay. It's not her vibe. That's why you you guys are that's it. opposites that's why attract. We, that's why we blend. Yeah. Uh-huh. For someone that is like you starting out and they, you know, only had $300 to spare or whatever the yeah. case is, what advice would you give them if they were going to start their business tomorrow? Yeah, I think it's. For us, like, obviously, we're lucky we had the heritage story created. Mm -hmm. I think it's like stay true to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Don't go off course and just stick to it. And you'll attract the right customers and the right audience and start building the right community. I think the biggest piece for me, and I definitely made a a mistake or many mistakes. I make mistakes every day. um, Is like you can listen to what everyone has to say and the outside noise as you're either picking up steam or starting or having no idea about something, Mm -hmm. but like take everything with a grain of salt and like absorb it. Cause like you don't, if they're not in a position to say it, or even if they are, it might've worked for them or they may have not ever experienced it. And they're just saying it because they're saying it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just like, make your own decisions. There's no blueprint. Like there's no right or wrong way to do something. And I think with everything that we're doing for Siegelman Stable, and I think you can apply it to different brands, like there's no blueprint. Like you can look at what other people have done in the past and what people are doing now and figure out how to apply that for what you are doing, but make it work for you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love that. And question everything, which I always say, which is like, oh, really? which is a Virgil Abloh quote. Uh-huh. But it's question everything, like question what everyone says. Mm-hmm. Um, when people say that like, oh, now's the time to grow and now's the time to outsource this and outsource that, just question it before you just move on it quick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. Question everything. Are there any other quotes that you kind of live by? That's definitely one. Uh, And then the background of my phone is also a virtual quote. It says, the only failure is not to try. 
Uh, Love that. Which I literally try and live by. I feel like Siegelman Stable is like the epitome of like, absolutely. You might as well give it a go and see what happens. Uh-huh. Kind of like the inflection point we we're talking about before is mm-hmm. like, time to leave the corporate job and do this thing full time and mm-hmm. see what happens. What has a mistake you've made that you're glad you made? Uh, listening to someone who I thought knew what they were doing. Uh, really? Yeah. Like we started to outsource fulfillment. We started to take a step maybe too soon, but maybe in the wrong way, or maybe it was the right time in, in the wrong way, um, to do those things. And it was just too quick. Maybe we didn't have the behind the scenes stuff, the protocols, the the right way of doing stuff set up for it to happen the right way. Um, and the best day ever was when a truck came and unloaded all of that shit back in front of our office in Brooklyn on pallets. And I was just left there by myself to figure it out and get it upstairs. Whoa. And I was like, honestly, it was amazing. I was like, thank God it's back. Yeah. Like we have full control now. Um, so I think when you start to lose some control, like you got to just catch it quick and not let it spiral because mm-hmm. it's a lot harder to start getting back. So those three months of that was probably one of the toughest three months of Siegelman Stable as a business to date. And then there's tough things literally every day that happen and mistakes you make every day, Mm -hmm. literally every day. Um, But I think that three month window is probably one of the biggest ones and the biggest lesson learned. And it was worth the education in those three months looking back at it. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Did you feel like you were giving up too much at such a small point in your business? We weren't giving up a ton, but we were giving up enough where if mistakes happened, that we weren't in control to make good on them. Got it. And it was time to bring it back right away. Mm-hmm. And I think we we hit it early enough in the process of going bad to bring it back and get control of it and not let it spiral mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. Okay. I want to ask you about money. Is there a milestone number that you would have to hit that you would be like, holy shit, this is crazy, uh, or that you've already hit? I think we've hit one where I'm like, holy shit. And then I think you get over it really fucking quick. And you're like, what's the next one? And then I think we hit it. And I'm like, holy shit. And then I think now we're on a road to hopefully what that is. And I I think anyone who's like, oh, there's not a number is probably full of shit. I also think like there's a number that we look at too of the amount that we can donate uh, Mm -hmm. as part of like our business and donating back. Mm -hmm. Like we wrote a pretty big check like after the first year of getting that first oh shit number uh and i had people question that and i was like you sure and i'm like yeah i was like i think that that's right at this point um and i think like the things that you start implementing early on are things that you can hopefully keep as you continue to grow Mm -hmm. um so yeah there's a new holy shit number this year so hopefully we hit it that's amazing is there anyone like in the business world that you really look up to when it comes to like, you know, growing your own business or you look up to them as a mentor or anything like that? Yeah, I think there's a handful of people um, like across the board, whether they're entrepreneurs or investors or um, start their own fashion brands or start their just own brands in general. And I've been lucky to surround myself by some of those individuals. And I think even on a smaller scale, surround myself around the right people um, who might have been early investors at place XYZ or been in the right place at the right time mm-hmm. and was part of a company that sold to a bigger company. Then they started a company and sold their company to that bigger company. Um, and I've strategically or just in an organic way, I've created relationships with those people and kept them close and mm-hmm. have asked them to help me along the way. And um, I think one of the, the few people that I've had with me even before Siegelman Stable is a friend of my brother's who by trait is a lawyer, but started a creative agency and has another agency now and still practices law, but is also part of Siegelman Stable as a lawyer. And uh, I think like having him to be able to call at any moment for advice is is huge. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've been lucky enough that Gary Vaynerchuk is Mm -hmm. close. And obviously you watch him from afar and he has a lot to say about the things that he does and involved with and his belief in a lot of different things. And I think being able to see him from afar and also seeing him close, I think having that um, that perspective on a lot of stuff is, is obviously helpful. Um, so I think it's, again, just surrounding yourself with the right people, which goes back to networking and mm-hmm. showing up at the right places and building relationships with people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's a big thing in any industry that you're in. Yeah. What do you think are like characteristics that a successful entrepreneur has to have? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, characteristics. 
I don't think there's necessarily a playbook for like, oh, if you don't have characteristic X, you're out. You can't be an yeah. entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's entrepreneurs in every size, shape, color, personality, whatever. And I think if you find that right lane for you, like stick to it and keep building on it. Mm-hmm. Um, characteristics, I mean, you just have to fucking work your ass off and be good with making mistakes. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to make a ton of fucking mistakes and you're just going to have to either learn from them or just move on. Mm-hmm. Um, and you might have to make that mistake five times. Mm-hmm. I've made the same mistake probably multiple times. And it's not because I chose to or I've definitely made an effort to try and not do them again. Mm-hmm. But things just happen. Uh, I think especially in the fashion industry, like the more I start to educate myself by being hands on and in production and in the factory is like, shit goes wrong Mm -hmm. all the time that something i love that you've said on other podcasts is you feel like you're warming up still yeah i always say i say in text messages i say in dms i say in phone how do you say it like in what context like we're just warming up we're just warming up okay where'd you get that from uh i think i think it started in um, my senior year of college we made a run to the final four um where'd you go to college uh, State University of New York, Oneonta, small state school in upstate Wow, area. awesome. Yeah. And we always used to say after every game, like after every win, like we're just warming up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's kind of stuck I with me. I love it. Yeah. That and actually another one was ELE, everybody love everybody. Whoa. Uh, which like I've also feel like I don't say that, but like I feel like I kind of try and live that. Uh-huh. I think it also goes back to like treating everyone the same. I feel totally. Like like, um, but yeah, and like we're just warming up. I will say that kind of in response to a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I truly feel like we haven't even started putting out stuff yet that we want. Mm -hmm. Um, Like when I say we want That's exactly how I feel like as a content creator. Like I feel like I'm just warming up. Yeah. Like when I say to some people like, yeah, we're going to do a runway show in two or three years. They're like, most of the time they look at me like, huh? (laughs) You make hats and sweatshirts. I'm like, Mm -hmm. yeah. Like I said, like we're just warming up. Like Mm -hmm. if you saw what we just fitted in the factory two hours ago. You'd be like, okay, maybe. Makes sense. Yeah. That tracks. So. What do you feel like you're bad at? A lot. When it comes to your <laughs> business, when it comes to running your business, like what do you feel like you struggle with or you're not the best at? Probably one of my biggest struggles is just like in certain circumstances, just like moving on. Like, okay, that didn't go how you wanted it to go. <sighs> like it's such a good answer. It sticks with me. Like certain things stick with me a lot. Um, Are you a grudge holder? On individuals, no. More so probably on myself than anyone. Wow. I think I probably hold, gr- I'm like pretty hard on myself. Mm-hmm. We're working through it. Same. <laughs> um, yeah. A little therapy will help you out. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. I think like I probably hold a grudge on myself on certain things that happen versus other people's actions because you have zero control of that. And like, I think it's good to remind yourself that a lot. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I think that's probably it. Yeah. That's a good one. I, I think it is hard to move on when you're like beating yourself up about you know, a mistake or how that went or what you did wrong or whatever. Yeah. That's that's challenging. Okay, last few questions are, what are your goals for Siegelman Stable in the next like five to 10 years? Yeah, give one away. I mean, I would love to do, or we would love to do a runway show in the next two or three years. Is this something like, in New York Fashion Week or like Paris Fashion Week or all of them or I think we still have time to decide. I like I always, I always say they go back and forth a lot. It's like you're a New York brand, so like duh, do New York. Yeah. But there's also the like the biggest nightclub in Milan is in a horse track. <gasps> and that's like, sick. It's pretty on brand. Um so I don't know. We got time. We'll see. It'd be so sick if like the models were riding horses or something. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have you co creative direct. Please. <laughs> I'll call you in. Please. Yeah. yeah love Caroline call you. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, so that besides runway, is there anything else you guys um, are wanting to do? Yeah, I mean I think more more and more like activations and pop ups. I like as as much as people are happy to buy a hat or a jacket for the prices that we have, I think it's like sometimes tough for a lot of people too without touching it and trying it on and seeing the quality mm-hmm. and like it's great if whoever's wearing it and they see it on Instagram, but like it's still a seventy six dollar hat. And it's not yeah. the cheapest hat. It's not the most expensive hat, but it's still money. Um so I think being able to have that experience and touch and feel and try it on is important for us. Mm-hmm. Um, we are aiming to do one this spring in Soho. Sick. Heard it here first. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that kind of evolves over the next few weeks or so. Mm -hmm. Um, I think more of that, uh, obviously collaborations for us has been a huge key to our marketing success and growing our community and our Mm -hmm. customer base. And we have a bunch in the pipeline and it's nice to start building out a calendar that's not 
uh, six days ahead and it's not six weeks ahead. It's now maybe six months ahead or 12 mm -hmm. months ahead. And I think that that's kind of the route that we want to start doing and building out seasonal calendar and, and having seasonal drops amongst the limited edition stuff and mm -hmm. collaborations. So I think it's just to continue to, to grow the business slow, strategic, organic, like it's definitely not a sprint. Like the shit's not easy. No, <laughs> it's it's very impressive what you guys have already done. I almost forgot to ask this, but I'm really am curious because I feel like you guys and your branding, which I know has a lot to do with Caroline's aesthetic, is y'all have really paved this wave for like bringing back this like horse girl aesthetic in a way. And I wanted to ask, like, how do you deal with all of the people that kind of copy or get inspiration from your brand? Um, yeah, inspiration is definitely a nice thing to say. Um, I think like <laughs> it's it's great, right? Like I, I probably get sent on Instagram from friends and from just random people a lot like, hey, have you seen this? Hey, have you seen this? And I think there's ways to um, embrace that. And I think that there's also a piece of us that needs to be super cautious mm -hmm. because we don't want a brand just to come out of nowhere and – uh, take anything away from what we're building. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I think when people are like, oh, like I love your merch, like that's one of the worst things you can say, I think to me and calling it merch. Mm -hmm. And I think I got it more when I first started and I was embroidering on blank hats and printing on blank sweatshirts. Mm -hmm. And like, that is merch. That's mm -hmm. correct. But Virgil also started Pyrex by buying blanks and- Everyone uh, starts somewhere. Correct, right? So I think- um, I think, yeah, I think the way we deal with it is is like Lawyer how up. we, like, <laughs> no, <I'm yeah>. <laughs> by the way, Lawyer was the first one on payroll over yeah. here. I can tell you that. Uh, it, I think it's the way we grow our, our brand, too. It's like we have a real story. So the first my first instinct sometimes is pissed off. My other instinct is also to say, like, good luck, dude. Mm -hmm. Like, good luck. Yeah. Um, but there's also um, there's also brands that are started um, by people who already have a following. Uh, and it's a lot easier for them to grow. And it's also like good luck. But like it's a different business too. Mm -hmm. like someone who already has a following and starts a, a e-commerce brand like you're 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 giving to your community. And mm -hmm. that's cool. Like I get it. Um, I think the aesthetic and like what we're trying to build, the story we're trying to tell and kind of where we're going uh, uh, in terms of like sustainability and using only organic upcycled materials and like. Mm -hmm. All the things that we're really paying attention to and build on the back end is the difference maker between us and I think what your quote unquote copycat um, uh, brands are, are trying to do. And so I wish them the best of luck. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have to say from my POV, you guys definitely like started that aesthetic and vibe and I've never thought your guys' stuff is like merch at all. It's very high that. fashion cool like i i don't know I, it almost seems like it would be like 10 times more expensive than it is yeah truthfully yeah so you I guys mean, have done a great job that's where I, I like sometimes we don't see eye to eye on pricing is like mm -hmm. I, I i sometimes like want to make everything as affordable as possible for people mm -hmm. but i also understand like how we want to grow the business where we want to get it's like you always can't do that mm -hmm. i also understand on the financial side is like like i was saying before like us using the materials that we're using like we are buying and using materials to make sweatshirts and hats and all this stuff that cost more and are better quality than brands that you see your favorite celebrities or whoever wearing mm -hmm. on a daily basis and already doing runway shows and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. to us, like those things are more important mm -hmm. than just making as much as possible and selling as much as possible. Like we'll never be in the fast fashion game. Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay, well, last question for you, Max, is what are you doing to make moves in your life right now? All of these things. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I don't know. We may need another hour. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, it's sticking true to storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I think it's sticking true to what we set out to do. And it's sticking true to creating sustainable, high-quality products mm -hmm. um, for our current customers and continue to tell our story to gain new customers and new audience. And I think it's literally just sticking to the story. Which is so awesome that you guys have that story because it's so rare to have mm -hmm. such a like basically born within you story like that. Yeah. And it's definitely it an upper hand. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely an upper hand when you're starting. It's not even nowhere, your story. Right? It's your life. It's, it's like literally it's the, my dad's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Mr. CEO himself. That's yeah, what he calls exactly. Him. Yeah. What's your dad's name? Robert. Robert. Shout yeah. out Robert. But like old footage, <laughs> we'll get like old footage sometimes. I like posted a picture of it the other day and uh-huh. it's like Bobby Siegelman. So like he goes to a track, he has like this whole different aura. He's like, yeah. he's like, Bob, Bobby. And I'm it's like, like Dude, his who like calls fun you name. Yeah. <laughs> it's like his jockey name or yeah. trainer name. I was like. So is he, is he the guy that can actually, like he's the jockey or the driver? So he trained the horses. So you sit the same way, like you train the horses, like you're sitting in the yeah. sulky of the cart behind it. Got uh, it. He did drive in races, and then my and he had my brother. Uh, he's like, he's like, I'll, I'll train. Take a step back People and to do that. try yeah. not to get hurt. Yeah. Crazy. Well, yeah. it's been such a pleasure getting to know you and your brand, and thank you for coming on the show. Of course, thank you for having me. And where can everyone shop Siegelman Stable? Siegelmanstable.com. Hopefully this spring in Soho, New York. Yeah, which is awesome. And where can they follow you? At Siegelman Stable on Instagram or Max underscore Siegelman. Amazing. Anyway, thanks guys for watching and be sure to make someone else's day this week. We'll see you next time. Bye.